Before we begin, I'd just like to say thank you to my friends at Hair Saloon for supporting this podcast and for providing space at their corporate offices to record it. Hair Saloon's mission has as much to do with the restoration of men as it does with the business of hair cutting. They try to make a difference in the lives of the thousands of men who come through their doors each week. Hair Saloon is based in St. Louis, Missouri, and if you've ever been interested in running your own business and want to work with great people, I would highly recommend you check out the Hair Saloon Franchise Opportunity. Go to hairsaloonfranchise.com to find out more information. That's hairsaloonfranchise.com. Also, a quick reminder to subscribe to this podcast if you haven't already and to please take two minutes to give us your review. And if you have a question or comment you'd like to share with our listeners, go to Suzanne at the thesuzannebankershow.com. Welcome back to The Suzanne Venker Show. I'm your host, Suzanne Venker. I'm super excited to introduce today's guest. Her name is Allison Armstrong, and you might have heard her on Dennis Prager's program. I believe he talks with her about four times a year on his male-female hour. Allison is a best-selling author and the founder of PAX Programs, a mission-driven company passionate about transforming the way men and women relate to themselves and to each other. In her book, The Queen's Code, Allison presents a fictionalized version of her own experience being what she calls a, quote, frog farmer, or a woman who brings out the worst in men by turning her prince into a frog. The Queen's Code offers a life-changing view of men that can turn your marriage or relationship around overnight. One of the main themes of the Queen's Code is that women have been acculturated to believe they should be their own heroes. Quote, women's television delivers this message over and over again with movies in which at most one good man might provide some small assistance as the heroine rescues herself. End quote. Those are the words of Claudia, the wise grandmother who tutors her granddaughter Kimberly in the art of loving and understanding men. I am over the moon to talk with Allison today, and I know you all are going to want to listen to this program again and again. The material is that powerful. Welcome to the show, Allison. I'm so excited to talk with you. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Great. So I want to talk about, um, or let's begin talking about the theme of the Queen's Code and where you fit into the equation with respect to your own story of once having been what you call a, quote, frog farmer, which won't mean anything to anybody until you explain. And (laughs) I'm particularly interested in how this whole concept stems from women having a very poor view of men. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Is that a good place to start? It's just, it's huge. It is. I know. That's why we're never going to get through all of this. You have no idea how much I have, Allison. Okay. Okay. So you want the 30 second, three minute or Uh, 30 day version? The three, (laughs) the three minute. The three minute version. (laughs) All right. So, uh, born in 1960, right? So the confluence of Barbie dolls and and a perfect, you know, housewife, make sure your house is guest ready at every moment because you're going to be judged, you know, upbringing um, with then women's liberation and my mom dancing around the kitchen saying anything you can do, <laughs> anything you can do, I can do better. Oh right. My. OK. Yeah. So the message that uh, you have to have a man, but don't need him. Got it. Right? Yep. You have to have a man, but you're better than a man. But you yes. have to have it anyway. Yep. <laughs> and so super confusing, right? And um, so, of course, I got married young. Uh, chemical romance. Uh, seven years of misery, which we both agree was worth it, that our son exists. Um, but I, I just really was left with thinking men are were subhuman. I questioned if they had souls. I knew they were stupid and weak and a pain in the butt. And um, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. And then it was my friend who was called a frog farmer because she, she asked, why is it that men are wonderful in the beginning and then they turn into sports watching, pizza eating, beer belching, couch slugs? And... And the man she said this to said, oh, I see, you're a frog farmer, 
which I love that you said nobody knows what that is, because originally when we published the book, I'd always called it the transformation of a frog farmer. But no one knew what a frog farmer was, so it was meaningless. And <laughs> Herb, the one who called my friend a frog farmer, explained that some women turn frogs into princes. And you, my dear, turn princes into frogs. <laughs> that must have hurt. That must have hurt. Or what did it? I don't know. Maybe it didn't. What did you think? Well, it, it, it bounced off of her and uh, struck me through the heart. And, and like Kimberly in the Queen's Code, um, it was a revelation. I was thrilled. I was thrilled. If I was doing something to bring out the worst in men... I wanted to know what it was because I knew I could change me and I had given up on being able to change them. And this was all after your first, this revelation came after the, your divorce? Yes. Yeah. Yes. This was in 1991 and um, I was out there dating a single mom. I, I, I. So, yeah. yeah. So it it's what set me on the course of deciding to study men. And I had the question, what if men are responding to women? And I thought it would take two or three months to learn everything that was worth knowing about them because, of of course, they're shallow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I've been acknowledged a lot for my dedication, and I've never dedicated myself. I have just been fascinated for almost 30 years. They're fascinating and extraordinary and as you know i'm their biggest fan yeah i know i know i was gonna say it's just like a complete transformation it's and it's and that's what you of course convey in so brilliantly in the queen's code which is a fictionalized version of you know you you want the grandmother to teach the granddaughter who i guess you were supposed to represent kimberly as to the <laughs> fact that she had men all wrong and that there were here's why you have them wrong and what if you looked at them in a completely new way and it's just this revelation that yes. changes the trajectory of her of her own life and marriage and so on and so forth well can i tell you how that happened yeah why it's fiction um i was trying to teach one of my sisters in laws um my husband has five brothers, uh, so oh she'll be na unnamed. I was trying to teach her something about men. I was trying to teach her about the stages of development, which Keys of the Kingdom is about. And she wouldn't – she was like, oh, uh, whatever, whatever. And then I started telling her this story that a friend and I had made up called The Princess and the Swamp Rat. And all of a sudden, she, like, just stopped everything she was doing and listened. And <laughs> – I was like, wow, okay, story. People learn better through stories. Yes. It's right. voluntary, yeah. right? Like you can yep. put yourself in any shoes. It's not in your face. You can you can dive in or just, you know, take on a little bit of it. I'm like, so this book that I've been planning to write, uh, okay, it's got to be a story. And literally the story started writing itself wow. on, a, on a paper bag. <laughs> Wow. A yeah, a grocery on a grocery bag. I was writing the beginning of the story um, on the way home from Oregon, and like Keys of the Kingdom, both stories, both stories were movies that I watched and typed as fast as I could. Wow, that's really interesting. That is very yeah. interesting, as, especially as somebody who has written solely nonfiction, and I've thought a lot about the other one, but every time I try, it's just pitiful. So I just close that door very quickly. So I'm very impressed. So I have to tell everybody, it's just, it's, it's just a great book, and we're going we're gonna to talk about it throughout. And, um, but at any rate, it's called The Queen's Code, and um, you focus so much on sex differences, of course, which is something I do as well, which we both know are crucial to understand if you want to make a relationship work. So there are a couple of things that stood out in the Queen's Code um, that I wrote down that I wanted you to sort of focus on in terms okay. of sex differences. Okay. One is, because I think they're very important, one is the fact that men are single focused and women are not. And you wrote in there that women can be single focused, but it may wear them out more, far, well, wear them out, period, since they mm -hmm. have a fraction 
of the amount of testosterone that men do. Yes. I thought that was really, that was a big one. Yeah, men have between 15 and 30 times more testosterone than women. Um, testosterone's like radioactive in women. Uh, I know so much more about this than I did when the Queen's Code was published because I've been on bioidentical hormone therapy for two years, and as was my husband. And I would take two milligrams of testosterone a day, and he took 100. Oh, my. <laughs> Yes, huge difference. Um, now, you know where my mind's going right now that you said that. <laughs> I actually don't know where your mind's going. <laughs> Thinking sex, <laughs> which we're going to get to sex later. I'm gonna, although we could talk about it now, but I do have that down to talk about because it's okay, so important. We, we can. It's, it's critical. Um, but the thing is that fo- we can focus what most women will do in order to be able to focus and we beat ourselves up because we call it, we think we're procrastinating, is we clean the environment. We have to put everything away. We have to tidy it. We have to, we have to get everything that could distract us um, either away from it or it away from us in order to knuckle down. Right. Um, I have to do that to write an article, for example, a nonfiction. And And it takes an enormous amount of energy, um, as does, I've discovered lately, emotion. Emotion spends testosterone like crazy, which no wonder men keep a grip on it. They don't want to go there because it actually, I can feel it weaken me physically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're just built different. And past menopause is a whole new reality because... We're more stable, if you will, because we don't have those surges of estrogen and progesterone. But we're half of our testosterone comes from the eggs we used to have, the ovum we used to have, and now it's gone. And so we're drawing entirely on our adrenals for testosterone. I could keep going. Well, so give, well let's give an example of how being single focused and men being single focused and women not causes a problem in a relationship. Just give an example. Sure. I'm sure there's a thousand, but (laughs) yeah, well, one that happens a million times a day is what creates focus is committing to a result or an intention or destination. That's what instigate focus instigates focus for men and for women. And Committed is a happy state for men. They have peace and freedom in being committed. And, but what happens is the moment they commit, their brain screens out everything considered irrelevant to that commitment, and including her (laughs) and what she's saying or what she's wanting. And it also encapsulates him, if you will. So it cuts off connection. And women, Um, if they're in what I would call gathering mode now, open, connective, possibilities, alternatives. When we're in that mode, when we're not focused, when we're open, we feel safe when we feel connected. So we will, we'll literally feel the disconnection. We can tolerate it for a certain amount of time. It's different for every woman. And then it'll cause such tension in it, in, in us, that we will attempt to reconnect. And we usually attempt to reconnect by interrupting what they're doing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing because this just <laughs> happened yesterday with my husband. <laughs> it's so helpful to think about it this way, because then I don't feel so guilty for having said to him, for having interrupted him while he's watching TV. And he says, I ask so many questions. I have no idea how many questions I ask and how many things I need from him throughout the day on a Saturday or Sunday. And he cannot just sit there for an hour without me bugging him and interrupting him. And I'm just, and I'm not trying to, I'm just doing something and I call out to him thinking, okay, we both live here. You know, we need to address something, but I have, I have got to tell myself, okay, when he's watching something, He's really, he's doing something. He's not just yeah. sitting there lazy. He's recharging, as you put it, to get mm-hmm. ready to do the next thing. And I have to remember that and leave him alone. End of story. That's it. Well, except 
you might. I mean, unless it goes on all day. Sorry. Well, but, <laughs> or you could get ahead of it, right? Honey, you know, every Saturday I have a ton of questions. So how about we set up a time that I get to ask my questions and I'll make a list and I won't bug you. Yes. And I won't be all worried about when am I going to get the answer because as already I already know you'll have given me a time that I'm going to get my answers. Yes. And yes. then you're free, he's free. It it could be way better. You're right. And actually, I did do that once, and it was like I say that once. <laughs> I did that once recently, and it was beautiful and brilliant and worked. It just worked. It's about remembering it. You know, that's what's so hard. It's like you see something that works, and I tell myself, and I try to write it down to remember it, and I just forget. So I just have to keep. Reminding myself, I guess, how to go about it. Well, or you could write it in your calendar for Friday night or Saturday morning. Set up time to talk. Definitely. (laughs) Definitely. Yeah. Okay. I don't depend on my memory. I can't. (laughs) It's getting worse by the year. Once you're over 50, forget it, right? It's hopeless, at least in my case. Well, because I take testosterone, which affects short-term memory, my... That part's fine. I just don't want to have to remember. I'd rather have something remind me, like something electronic. <laughs> Definitely. Instead of spending energy remembering. Okay, now I want to get into what I consider personally the meat of the Queen's Code. I don't know if you do, but I do. This is what I got okay. from it. Because okay. I think this encapsul- encapsulates the crux of it. And it's such right. a big issue in the world today or in with men and women today. You listed, you listed there pretty much all the ways in which women can emasculate men, either knowingly or unknowingly, Uh, pretty much unknowingly. I think for a lot of women myself, that's been my experience. What are some of those ways and what, and explaining, and we all sort of know what that means, but if you want to, you know, identify emasculate, or I think you use the word castration a lot, whichever, Mm -hmm. however you want to define it. Well, men kind of flinch, flinch when you say castrate, so I stop saying it. Okay. Um, and we define emasculation the way that a man did for me, um, which is to diminish someone's ability to produce results. Because that's what some people might refer to as the masculine or what men connect with, is their job is to produce results. And if you diminish their ability to produce results – they they're weakened and they have really bad reactions to that right they get emotional reactions like as much as fury or rage literally we're threatening their ability to survive um one thing though suzanne that's important to know is that everything we do to emasculate men we also do to diminish women and we also do to diminish ourselves Yes, that was one of the questions, uh, one of the statements I, you've said that I wanted you to expound upon, that you, the more power your partner has, the more you both have. Yeah. And yeah. when we, so let's say, for example, one of the things we do that diminishes men's ability to produce results is we withhold appreciation. Appreciation fuels them. It's the wood for the fire. And we withhold it. And like one man said, why don't I ever get 80 points? Why is it 100 points or zero, right? So our instinct to survive through perfection has us always look at what wasn't done, what isn't perfect, right? Which is why to women, women are, we're ugly. Mm -hmm. To men, women are goddesses. They're, They're not looking for what's not beautiful. Their eyes are attracted to beauty. The not beauty, they don't even see it. Their brains screen it out. So God bless them for that. I was, I was just going to say, I mean, and it's such a, it's such a better quality than it just <laughs> is. It just is. I mean, we should emulate that. Well, I've men have, yes, I've spent enough time with men that I now see women through men's eyes and it's, it's glorious. Mm-hmm. We are, oh my gosh, what a treasure chest. So what happens is we're seeing what isn't perfect about something. And so we don't, we withhold appreciation, but we also withhold appreciation from ourselves. We don't, we don't, we don't pat ourselves give, on the back enough or what have you. Is that what you mean? Well, yeah. appreciation has an element of, th- of, uh, thank you for doing that for me. 
right? Mm -hmm. Appreciation is personal. You took out the trash for me. And what we'll do is acknowledge, like, yeah, it's good that you did that. <laughs> yeah, good. The trash needs to be taken out. No, to men, trash has no need. <laughs> it's an inanimate object. It doesn't need anything. Well, to a woman, inanimate objects need things. The pillow needs to be straightened. Yeah. The trash needs to be taken out. The bed needs to be made. So it's one of the reasons we don't appreciate men and we don't appreciate ourselves. We don't take personally what would be better to take personal. Okay. What else? Criticism. Just so you know, just so you know, I've got a whole list from your book in case we don't have time. <laughs> for so I'm going to list whatever you can't remember or forget. Maybe okay. I should just let you No, no, no. I like <laughs> I'm going to do the most, it probably the, the highlight ones. Okay. We withhold, we withhold accountability. So we, we turn men into implementers and taskers instead of letting them own the results they're going to produce for us mm -hmm. and give them the quality information they need, which is another way we emasculate is withholding quality information, giving them the quality information they need in order to score 100 points with us. We think they should already no. know. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to expose ourselves. We don't want to be that vulnerable that we're telling them actually how to make us happy. So um, that's another way we emasculate. And it's, oh my gosh, accountability is so important to who men are. It's where they, it's where they experience that they can win. And if we don't ever release or entrust accountability to them, they, they're demeaned by that. Like, look, I'm not a kid. I'm not a helper. I'm not an employee. Give that to me or not. <laughs> so that's an interesting dynamic. Um, of course, withholding sex, famous, mm -hmm. um, withholding attention. I, that's a hard one because while I'm encouraging you to set up a time to talk to your husband, <laughs> your husband's just going to start talking to you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> when he needs attention. Yeah. I know. Oh. He's not going to return the favor. I know. <laughs> oh, my Lord, do I know. Yes. All of a sudden, yeah. if I put ear, he, he's taken to using earphones because the TV is right in the, like, we don't have a separate TV room. And so he wears these oh. headphones. So it doesn't bother me because I don't want to hear necessarily the TV. And so then. Yep. And he kind of does that regularly. And the other day, I, I put on earphones for my computer, and he started talking to me. <laughs> I took I took a thing out, and I said, "Oh, is this what it's like <laughs> to you know have someone talk to you?" And you're it was it was very funny. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Once I asked Greg, um, when you start talking, do you expect me to start listening? <laughs> I know. I can't tell you how many times I said, "Wait, start over, please," because my mind was somewhere else completely. Let's just rewind. Does your marriage or love life feel hard? I get a lot of emails from readers who are struggling in their relationships. Unfortunately, the help an individual or couple needs can rarely be answered in a series of back and forth emails. For this reason, I offer coaching for individuals who are struggling in their relationships and for couples whose marriages feel stuck. Just go to SuzanneBenker.com and click on coaching at the top to sign up for a session with me. That's SuzanneBenker.com. And we, we both have to do that. We both have to make sure we have the other person's attention, willing attention, yeah. not demanded attention, if we're getting up with the, the connection we're looking for and the information we're looking for. Um, so let's see, all forms of withholding. So withholding accountability, appreciation, attention, sex. Um, I call those the green emasculation because, because <laughs> you're saving energy by what you're not doing. <laughs> At least you think. Those are good ways to emasculate. Um, but it turns out very badly. Yes. Yeah. Um, other things, criticism, uh, criticism. I do a whole piece on in our understanding women course because women use criticism on men the way that it works on women, which criticism changes women's behavior and very quickly. And women don't know that men actually have five layers of protection against acting on criticism um, but what it does cause is distance. It does cause uh, a hesitancy to commit. And since they're empowered when they're committing, committed, us 
putting up obstacles to commitment, the sense the right. opposite of what women think about men, um, is just empowering to them. Which ones do you wish I said? Mothering. Nope, you got that. Okay, so those are the main ones that I have here. Ignoring. Um, yep, you have. It, yep, there's ignoring him, interrupting him. Oh my gosh, I think that's <clears throat> huge. So, um, comparing him, comparing compa- him, yep, yep. yourself, men, women, comparing him to anybody, even favorably. Comparisons aren't uh, generally empowering. I feel like this is a test. It's not supposed to be. Allison. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hold on, let me just read these. The rest of these. Wait, wait. Let okay, me get okay, the okay. script out. What, what, what came, what came uh, through there? Uh, fortunately, this, you know, I know this all too well. Uh, what else do you want me to okay, talk about? Okay, uh, what uh, mocking what he does. Well, I, I don't know. I might have put this one down. Um, gosh, I've heard women when they're roll their eyes or mocking what their husbands do for a living or how much money they make. And I just want to reach over and just strangle them. Mm. That's a big one. I mean, I shouldn't say it's a big one. I don't know how big it is, but whenever I experience it, it's really hard for me to keep my mouth shut. Um, letting Can I me, go reflect ahead. that sure. for you? Mm-hmm. So why that matters so much is because the woman that he has chosen, right? This is the one he's committed to. He's supposed to take care of her, give her what she needs, and make her happy for the rest of her life. So her points mean the most, right? Her yep. her points mean the most. They're the yes. most valuable. Her credit is the most valuable, which also means that her criticism is the most hurtful. Mm-hmm. No one can hurt him more than she can. Nope. And... To denigrate him or his accomplishments or his ability to provide, women think, this is in the area of criticism, we think that that will have them try harder. No. No, no, right. No, oh. that's what it does to a woman. <laughs> no, it it's crushing. And it, it's not inspiring or motivating in any way. The, the only, and this is what I've been trying to tell women lately, the only men who are motivated by you being upset or disappointed are men who experience being dis- dependent upon you. Yeah, yeah. And when was the last time you wanted to have sex with a man who was dependent upon no, you? That's a whole, so that's, yeah, I, I, I get into that a lot in my work and it's not pretty. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> very, very, very bad. Oh my gosh. Um I love how you put things. I, I have to say <laughs> one thing. Not pretty. I, I know, it's not. Um, I, I'm it's guilty. It's ugly. Of, it's really, really ugly. It is. It is. Well, okay. So turns out well. So full disclosure: this was my parents' marriage. I'm not. I'm not sure if that's what you were getting at at the beginning or not with your mom. But for me, this this was my parents' marriage, and they never. It, was never rectified and they really did not have the tools um, to get out of it. If you were to present the tools, I'm not sure they would be able to use them. So it had a dramatic effect on me, needless to say, which is why I'm very um, interested in this, in this topic and indeed wrote a whole book myself on helping women um, learn how not to be bossy and controlling. That's essentially what the book is about. Um, Mm. Is that the bossy wife diet? So the bossy wife diet is an accompaniment to the book, The Alpha Female's Guide to Men and Marriage. So the bossy wife diet is like a condensed version of that that I offer for free on my website when people sign up and they get these mm-hmm. three free ebooks and that's one of them. Wow. So it's like a really shortened version of The Alpha Female's Guide. Yeah, The Bossy Wife Diet. I like that title better. I kind of wish I had made the book. <laughs> Don't you hate that after you wrote a book and then you think of something better after it's all done? <laughs> so annoying. Okay, and one of this, one of these things on this list I have to say I am guilty of. And I've got to do something about it. It's bad. It says being disinterested in his passions. Mm. So, like, I'm not very good at sitting there when I hate something just because he enjoys it and he th- he doesn't ask me to do it because I think he knows I don't, don't like to do things I don't want to do. <laughs> yeah. Um and I have to I have to do that more. Um it's hard. Or like hockey games. He loves the hockey and he 
And he has brought me to hockey games, but I'm not appropriately excited when I'm there. And I don't, you know, jump around like the kids will or, or he and his friends will. So, of course, he'd rather go with his friends. And I try to get excited. And he says I look really fake when I'm doing it. I'm just oh. terrible at faking anything. Would you tell him something for me that yes. might help? Yes, I'm going to have him listen to this. So you could tell him directly if you like. What's his, what's his first <laughs> name? His name's Bill. Bill. Okay, Bill. So this is the thing you need to know. <laughs> Studies have shown that the difference between a man and a woman's ability to track an object depends upon how fast the object is moving. So the faster that it's moving, the greater the ability of a man to track it as opposed to a woman. So this is the problem with women in hockey games. We can't track the puck. I'm always saying I can't see what's happening. I try really hard to focus, and then I, I lose track of the, the puck. It doesn't matter if you're focused. You t- still couldn't see it. It's moving too fast for us to see it. This is a hunter vision, right? Hunter vision can not only track the object, but predict where the object's gonna t- going to end up, Right. So throwing the ball where it needs to go when the receiver's not there yet. And, I mean, it's all about killing deer. So this is why men don't see dust. It's not moving. Oh, my God. Right? Oh, my God. (laughs) This is why when a man is driving and a woman is a passenger, he is making the obvious inappropriate moves in between cars without revealing his plan to the enemy while she's in a panic that we're going to hit a car or be hit by a car. (laughs) <laughs> don't tell me how to drive exactly i'm scared i'm gonna get killed <laughs> exactly this has everything to do with our vision which also by the way we have better peripheral vision than women i mean than men because we are more prey than predator right we have yes. we have both we have <laughs> we have wolves and horses trying to have a relationship okay so, so you have a predator <laughs> you, <have> a, yeah. <laughs> you yes. literally have predator and prey right. trying to make a family. Yes. And <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, literally, <laughs> literally. It's so funny to me. Um, but it's, but also as women, we have scan vision, right? We're the gatherers. So we have scan vision so they can track objects that are moving. We know every object that's out of place. So you say, where are my keys? Which they say all the time. They don't say, do you know where my keys are? They say, honey, where are my keys? And we know. Oh, I always know. You and then when I ask him where my glasses are, he said, I'm done. I give up trying to find your find your glasses. <laughs> <laughs> He's of no help, but I can tell him exactly where something is. Exactly. Or as we were joking about on Thanksgiving, <laughs> as a hunter, there's just the deer in front of you. Yay, a deer. Shoot it. Drag it home. Right. If you're a gatherer, you know that there are berries on the inside of the bush. You know, there are berries on the backside of the bush. Right. You want to get all the berries. You don't just want to grab one and take it home. So if you ever want to hide food for a man from a man, just put it in the second row in the refrigerator. Right. If it's really precious, put it in the third row. He'll never. I don't know. With my husband, he might find it. But. (laughs) Um, okay, I want to I want to to close the conversation about emasculation a little bit. I'm going to okay. use something else that you said that I thought was brilliant, and I thought that drives it home really well. You said, "What if men are like a Ferrari, but mm-hmm. it's out of gas and it has four flat tires? It can't mm-hmm. take you anywhere." Yep. So men are this, you know, this great machine that can do wonders. But if you emasculate him, that car is completely out of gas, has four flat tires, and it's useless to you, which, of course, then makes you useless. So what the hell is the point? Not that you're doing it necessarily with that, you know, you know, with purpose. A lot of people, I think a lot of women do this by... Um, well, so this gets into more of the cultural and social issues that I write so much about, but men, of course, are extremely disenfranchised in America, and they are told that they're stupid and um, less than in countless ways in movies and film and commercials, and this has been a steady drumbeat for, for women since the day they were born, and when you're used to something and it just happens over and over on a daily basis, you just become numb to it and you just pick it up and start doing it. So I do think a lot of this emasculation is sort of subconscious in a way. 
Do you agree? Um, I do. I think fundamentally it's born of fear and frustration. Um, we don't, I mean, we have millennia of being on the wrong end of their physical strength and their, um, and then, and the violence that's inherent in all human beings. Mm -hmm. And so there, I mean, there's a reason that we have a fear reaction to an empowered man. Um, but that power's only abused in a small percentage but trauma memory in the brain doesn't account for that. It gets applied. A man who's never raised his hand to his wife, he raises his voice. Mm -hmm. She'll have a reaction as if he's about to raise his hand. And it's Definitely. it's primitive. Yeah. They're all just very primitive reactions. Yeah. And then, yes, it has become enculturated to, in fact, we, we talk about this, that that it's your duty to take men down. Yes. It's you're supposed to do that. Um, it's how, how else are we going to protect ourselves and our families and our communities? We can't let them run around with full tanks of testosterone. Terrible things will happen. But what's interesting, and John Gray actually taught me this and I bless him for it. It's not high testosterone men that we need to fear. It's actually low testosterone. <laughs> and I've, I've learned a lot about it. Low testosterone makes men mean and grumpy. So we, as we disempower men, we're ending up with the worst of who they are. And then, as you know, it has the double effect of we've just weakened them. Mm -hmm. we, ex we feel that they're weaker, which then compels us to step in and take over more, Precisely. which then exhausts right. us. Right. And the cycle, uh, the thing that I, I that I want to say about this is that this is so natural and normal. Men and women have opposing instincts. If we don't become aware of them and catch them in the act, every relationship's going to end up in a sewer. And not because there's anything personally wrong with any of us. It, it, it's set up that way. I'm pausing because I'm I'm just thinking about how we only know this or you know this as of, you know, the last 20, 30 years, but I'm thinking about everybody before that mm -hmm. <laughs> and how lost they must have been when the communication was poor because they didn't understand what was going on. I mean, we're we're at such a we're in such a position now to understand it that all we really need are the tools which is what I try to do, and certainly what you do and what I try to do with understanding the differences between men and women. But when you're so bombarded by the culture, as you pointed out in the Queen's Code in the story about the, uh, was it Myra? Mm, yes. Myra is Kimberly's mother. Oh, oh, that's right. She's her mother. And her mother yeah. was part of the mentality of uh, her father left her or what have you. So she had this residual of course feelings about men as a result of a bad you know really broken relationships with men in my opinion or relationships where men didn't come through for whatever reason or were harmful whichever are what stay with women forever i think and what causes them to lash out at, at really innocent men um so that's a that's a non-cultural issue that's more of a you know upbringing thing um I would like to tie up what you said, though. Okay. That is, as near as I can tell, our behavior is sourced from our instincts, which when they're triggered, we feel tense and we're compelled to behave in ways that don't turn out well almost ever. And then each culture has a way of kind of sanctifying that and and it's expected and it's normal and no one speaks out against it. Yeah, that and makes I, sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, well, of course you're going to take his head off. He deserved to have his mm -hmm. head taken off. Mm -hmm. And so people like you and I were working. I mean, that's actually was the initial mission of my companies to transform society's culture 
right? Mm. Um, so that's what we're working on, and it's happening, which is exciting to see. But it makes it even more painful to see where where it's not what I yes. call the, the barrel, and and the consequences, right? The consequences in in boys failing in school, for oh. example, are just I you know we started on that subject we could exactly. Hour on that. Oh. It's a, we, we should do a show on it. I know. Um, it's, it's so Im- important. And so, I, yeah, there's work to be done personally in our own lives. But once you start on it, what I found out when I gave up emasculating men was it became physically painful for me to observe any man <sighs> be emasculated. Yes, 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 yes. yes. And... And part of my most favorite work is actually teaching men how to, I call it the ninja level, how to not allow themselves to be a master. Oh my gosh, I'm writing a book on that right now. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, Good it's just you. a short, it's not a book book. I can't write any more book length books. Five is enough. But this is a, um, this is a short ebook because, you know, you got to get to the point with men. <laughs> They don't yes. like long books, so typically. So I'm I'm doing a short guidebook on that very thing. <laughs> well, we should talk about that too, but um, you want to talk about sex. Well, I wanted to say I'm going to bring up one thing, and then you can explain this because I thought this was – I laughed out loud. When <laughs> you – told I don't know what interview it was. You said um, that your husband, Greg, was mm-hmm. fixing the washing machine. Something was wrong with it. And as he was fixing it, it was so hot to watch him <laughs> go into action to fix it. And I laughed out loud because I literally had the same experience a few years ago when I needed the bottom of my um, desk removed. You know, it had this computer piece that comes out, and I wanted my husband to remove it. Well, he had to get down on his back. Uh-huh. Yes, I never have seen him in this position. I don't think doing this something like this. And he had his arms up with the tools <laughs> to take the thing down off. And I had this total rush of sexual desire. And I thought, oh, my God, what was that? So when you said that, I just laughed out loud. So I can't believe somebody else said something similar to that. So please explain to my audience why we got so excited by that. <laughs> well, um <laughs> Sexual desire, um, besides strangeness, and I think even more important than strangeness or distance, sexual desire is in response to the perception of strength. And at least for women, perceiving strength in a man. So there he is solving a problem, fixing something, a man at work, focused, providing right? He's doing something for you. And especially if you don't know how to do it. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, that's it. That is the element. So doing something you don't know how to do, you couldn't do, he's doing it for you. Yay. Yay. Awesome. Hot. Yes. Right? And I think it's why I love, I just love watching men at work. That It's just such a turn on oh, completely. to watch men working. And uh, but all, all strength, right? All, whether it's status is perceived as a strength, intelligence, integrity, you know, a man saying no. Yes. Yes. <laughs> no, so much. that crosses the line. Yes. No. Yes. Really? Could I have sex with you now? <laughs> Absolutely. Gosh, I wish. So that's, that has so much to do with this, this, this short ebook I'm writing to explain, stop saying yes all the time and asking what she wants to do. Just be more um, forceful. When you say no, that's hot. That's going to get you more sex than if you say yes. But I think men have been conditioned to please women because of the culture. And, and, and that's not working (laughs) at all. Well, which is not to say you should never be kind or do anything for that's not what I mean. You know, that's why I have to explain it in the book, but go ahead. Well, oh boy. Okay. That's a big one. So, I know, I know because it's be, – and the reason why I jumped in, Suzanne, is because, yes, there's a certain culture, but it, this actually happens individually. We, we condition men – okay, 
All right. So when you say we, you mean women? Do you mean women? Yes. Women individually condition an individual man to that it's not worth it. It's not worth it to stand up to her. It's not worth it to say no to her. It's not worth it to tell her the truth. And how do we condition them? Well, okay. So one of the things that women invest in that we, we get on like a train (laughs) and that is thinking that the more upset I am about a behavior and the more, and, and if I have conveyed that to you bigger and bigger and bigger, the more upset I am about a certain behavior that will motivate you to change that behavior. If you know how much it upsets me, you'll stop doing it because it would work on a woman. So, for example, if a man tells a woman the truth and she's upset about the truth that he told her and she makes sure he knows how upset she is about that, she thinks he will change what's true for him. But he's smarter than that. Yes, He knows where the problem came in. The problem did not come in with what's true for him. The problem came in with him telling Telling her. her. Yes, which is the whole, do I look fat in this outfit thing. Exactly. So we, or more than that, like the real truth and nothing but the truth. So we actually teach honest men, it's not worth it to tell the truth. I will make you pay for your truth. You will not be honored for being honest. You will not be honored for being clear. You will not be honored for setting a boundary and standing up for what you need. That will not be honored. You need to give in to me always. That's that's how that's what we're communicating to them by how much we get on the upset train. So how do you how do you help women uh, not do that? Well, women need to decide. Do you, what do you want? Do, if you, if you value honesty, you have to reward honesty instead of use it against them to try to change who they are. Anything yep. that you appreciate about men, you will get more of anything you appreciate about men sincerely, appropriately, not overblown, not withheld, they will generate that behavior because they they literally got rewarded or paid for it by that appreciation. Anything a man ever did for you that he didn't do again, you didn't appreciate it sufficiently or in a way that he could experience it. Mm. Men, the way we say it is men play for points, yeah. right? We say yeah. in the Queen's Co., we say it in our Understanding Men Online course. So it's – we have to – I mean, this may sound terrible, but – we got to grow up. Please. I, I've i said it many times. It does sound <laughs> terrible. And there's no other way to say it, Allison. There really isn't because it's really about maturity and looking at your situation and the and your husband or your guy as a human being just like you, 50-50 in terms of value, and that he's just as complex as you are. He's not a lesser version of you, and I know you talk about that, that – yeah. Um, they're not hairy, ver- men aren't hairy versions of women, which is another, by the way, theme, I think of the queen's code, right? Is this concept that, that men are just women with a penis, I guess. I don't know how else to <laughs> that they think like you and act like you or they should. And so you're approaching it thinking they're your quote unquote equal and they're not. Well, I mean, equal in that, that they're you know. the same thinking that they're the same, same. but they're behaving thinking they see the world the same way, but are just choosing to be difficult or childish. I mean, it, it's why it's called the Queen's Code. As women, we we need to grow up. We need to have a higher standard for ourselves, for, for our own behavior, for our own approach, for our own empowerment, for our own being informed. As long as we think men are a kind of woman – we're always going to be ineffective because we're not dealing with reality. <sighs> Say that again. Cause that's a really, I, that's, I know you have to go and that's a really good way to end thing. I have more of course, but I, I, I know you have to go say that again. 
That's as good. long as we're as long as we're interacting with men as if they're a kind of woman, we'll be ineffective. Because it's that's not real. They are not a kind of woman. Their brains, their brains were pickled in a different sauce. And as it were ours. And and when we start paying attention to the differences, there's actually beauty in it. We are we can be elegantly complimentary. I always invite people to see if they can think of the unfortunately very few long married couples, perhaps, or really just any couple who stands out because they are so clearly complementary and not and devoid of any of that competitive energy that is so common today. And when you see that, it should stand out because it's more unusual to see that. Hold on to that, right? Take that in, observe it, get a picture of that in your, in your head. And I always think that the easiest way to get back to that, especially in a long-term relationship, is to think about the way you were when you were first dating. I think that's so um, easy to get your head around because people can typically remember that, I think. And the way you approach him, and this goes the same for him as well, was so different than 20 years in, you know, which, of course, it has to be. This, you know, life and stressors and kids and all that have come along. But if you can remember how you, you know, treat him and treat her the way you would as if you were dating, and see if you don't get a different result immediately. Yeah, I think that's definitely an access. Or what Greg and I were doing for the last six years, um, we were just finding out and inventing more ways to be kind to each other. How else, how else could we delight each other? How else could we be kind to each other? How else could we be generous with each other? Because the purpose of our marriage had been fulfilled. We'd raised our family. I'd written the Queen's Code. That's what we got together for. And so now what we're going to do? Well, let's see how sweet we could be to each other. That's what we did for six years. We just were sweet on each other. It was even better than when we were dating because we <laughs> knew so much more, right? I Yes, I'm and so then, glad to hear you say that. We're about at that point. <laughs> oh, very <laughs> almost, good. Almost empty nesters, and um, we're excited, actually. <laughs> Unlike some people who get very, very sad, I'm not sure that's quite how we're going to be experiencing it. <laughs> <laughs> much as we love well, our children. Our, our kids were always saying, get a room. And yeah. we're like, hey, now we have a whole house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It must look very different to have a house and and live in it uh, with your spouse after the kids are gone. Because right now everything's just about when are they going to walk in the house or, you know, it's just now I feel like I have a roommate because he's so old. But it's just weird, you know, and when he's not around, it's like, oh, look, this is what it's going to be like, honey, in about a year and a half. <laughs> it's great. Yes, there's, there's, there was there was a lot of nakedness and yeah. open doors <laughs> and spontaneous eruptions yes. anywhere in the house. And Yay. it was, yeah. I can't wait to have my husband listen to this. Okay, <laughs> we need to close out because I know you have to go, Allison, but will you come back? I would love to come back. Awesome. We have so much more to cover and this has been so much fun. And I really, really love what you're doing, respect what you're doing. It's just fabulous. And um, I, why don't you tell everybody the easiest way to, to find you? Understandmen.com. Okay. Understandmen.com. And I also noticed that you have something called the Queen's Code, a, web, a separate website. I just saw that today for the first time. What, what's up yeah. with that? Is that they're just... We, ori- we originally published the Queen's Code one chapter at a time, a week at a time, um, on the Internet in 2012 and it was being read in 70 countries within three weeks because of doing it like that on that site on that site yeah right from that site and there's videos the readers would post videos and i'd answer their questions there's all kinds of good stuff at thequeenscode.com okay and and that's where the ebook is and you can download it to any device it actually re it actually interprets what device you've got and it's a cool thing. Awesome. Okay, thequeenscode.com and understandmen.com. 
Yep. Awesome, Allison. Okay, I'm going to be calling you soon to come back. Okay, deal. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Well, that wraps up another edition of the Suzanne Venker Show. My guest today was Allison Armstrong. Don't forget to tune in next week when we talk with G.S. Youngblood, author of The Masculine in Relationship, a blueprint for inspiring the trust, lust, and devotion of a strong woman. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.